Wow. You see the title up there? It says Receiving and Giving. Um, if you think this is going to be a stewardship sermon, well, they always are a stewardship sermon. It's all about how we give ourselves away. But this is not about whether you put anything in the offering boxes in the back. But you see, we just heard the Lord's Prayer. The prayer that Jesus used as an example as he responded to the disciples when they said to him, Lord, teach us to pray. We find this in Matthew's Gospel and in Luke in a different, different textual setting. But today I want to share just briefly a part of another prayer of Jesus, the one that is called the High Priestly Prayer. And it's in the Gospel of John in the 17th chapter. Many of you know of that passage where Jesus prays for his disciples. What we don't find in John is Jesus praying in the garden before his arrest. There's, there's no prayer of Jesus in agony or the sweat dropping like blood and no appeal for the cup to pass from him. That's not in John's Gospel. Instead, we find Jesus praying for us. He's still at the table with his disciples and he's praying for them. And as we read through John, we see that his prayer falls between that point where he is giving the new commandment that we love one another and then his arrest. Love one another. I'm going to pray for you that God will be with you. And then he's arrested. If we stop to ponder, we'd see that he is connecting his time that he spent walking with his followers to a future when they have no idea what's going to happen. As you hear and as you read these verses, I want you to listen for a couple of words that are important today in the passage that we're going to share. One word is world and the other is giving. There's giving and other forms of action of that, either gave or given. But if repeat for emphasis is the rule, John must have thought that these were important to Jesus. As we hear these few verses from John, the 17th chapter, verses 6 to 19, listen for those words. Jesus prays and says, I have made your name known to those whom you gave me from the world. They were yours and you gave them to me and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything you have given me is from you. For the words that you gave to me I have given to them and they have received them and know in truth that I came from you and they have believed that you sent me. I am asking on their behalf. I'm not asking on behalf of the world, but on behalf of those whom you gave me, because they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I have been glorified in them. And now I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you, Holy Father. Protect them in your name that you have given to me so that they may be one as we are one. <coughs> While I was with them, I protected them in your name that you have given me. I guarded them and not one of them was lost except the one destined to be lost so that the scripture might be fulfilled. But now I am coming to you and I speak these things in the world so that they may have my joy made complete in themselves. I have given them your word and the world has hated them because they do not belong 
to the world, just as I do not belong to the world. I'm not asking you to take them out of the world, but I ask you to protect them from the evil one. They do not belong to the world, just as I do not belong to the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you have sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself so that they also may be sanctified in the truth. And God bless to our hearing. These words of Jesus from John's Gospel this morning. I think you can tell from this passage that the world is not really a friendly place for John's Jesus. We know that the world has re rejected him, is threatening his disciples, and Jesus asks that God would protect the disciples from it. The ones who initially heard or read John's message, I think they really understood what this meant because you see, just by accepting and believing in Jesus in those days, they were rejected by their neighbors, by members of the synagogue, and they felt abandoned. Their world was a dark place. And more than just a location, the world for John is a threat to those who worshiped God. I think in some ways you and I have experienced a similar foreboding during the past 14 months. As it seemed as if the world was conspiring against us. Everything we'd want to try, there was a block somewhere. Everything we'd want to try to do, it was not easy. If it didn't directly affect us, we saw it in the lives of others. Yes, the pandemic, the loss of jobs, the grief of lost loved ones, along with all the other issues surrounding us. There's the racial and economic injustice in our country, but also the conflicts we read about and hear about in places like Myanmar and between the Palestinians and the Israelis in South Sudan and the Democratic Republic of Congo in Brazil and many other places around the world. For so many, the world is a dark Place. The second word that stands out, though, is giving. And there is lots of giving going on in this prayer. You saw and heard that there is receiving as well. Jesus talked about what his Father had given to him and how he had received that. See, God has given Jesus his disciples, his teaching, the Word, and God's name, to name a few. And Jesus, in turn, has given all of those things to the disciples. One of the dominant characteristics of God in John's Gospel is one who delights in giving. See, after a rough time in our lives, like this past year or any time, we need to realize that God is not one who looks down in disapproval, ready to enforce some discipline on us. Instead, God is giving. So many people, in fact, when kids are growing up, they think, uh, like I used to see in the family circus cartoons, that God is this white-haired, long beard, on the throne, looking down, and going, tsk, 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 tsk pointing, that's not the God we think about and the God that we know. Rather than wagging a finger of warning, warning, God is reaching out to embrace an open hand giving all good things. See, God, according to Jesus, gives and gives and gives some more. Why else come to God in prayer? Sharing hopes, concerns, fears, and dreams. Because you see, God listens, God cares, and God gives. 
But if we take these two words, if we take these two words, we might acknowledge that the world is a challenging and at times a dark place, but more importantly, God is not done yet. We need to know that. He has not given us as followers of Jesus, God's children, not given us all there is. These two words, world and giving, come together in another place in John's Gospel. You've heard it. A number of chapters and really several years earlier, Jesus had this exchange with a Pharisee, a local leader, who comes to him with questions. It's hard to tell whether the answers Jesus gave him had any impact at all. But near the close of the conversation with Nicodemus, Jesus says this, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but have eternal life. Here we have it. The world, the dark place that is hostile to those who follow Jesus, is the one to whom God gives the greatest gift. He gives the world Jesus. Nothing in or of the world can withstand the grace and mercy of God's gift of love. And you know that. So many of you have experienced it. In this story, the disciples of Jesus and John's community keep on receiving and giving and witness to the one who dwelt among them and who dwells among us in grace and truth. Wrapped in that same love, we are strengthened, we are encouraged, we are called, we are commissioned, we're equipped, we're sent out into that same world, not simply to survive, but to flourish. That is, giving God's love to others. We can do that in word and in deed. As we have received it, we can give it away. Today we had a public witness of that in our presence. You see, Sarah and Dustin received a gift from God that is unlike any other gift. There is none like Mello. Just like they received Amelia. But they came today to give her back to God and to raise her in God's love and prepare her to be able to face the world in the days ahead. It's not an easy task, but many of us have done it and continue to encourage one another. We receive from God even our children and we give them back to God. Think of all that you have received. All that you have received that God has given to you. Over the years, over the years you've been able to face the world because of the gifts you have received. And I know that some of you are learning about that day. God loves you. Strengthens you. Provides for you. Prepares you to give back to others. We have that privilege to give back to those in the world who need to know Jesus. You heard how many times Jesus in the prayer talked about the world. I'm not of the world and neither are they. But we are in the world. What do we do today? We pause and realize how much we have been given. How much we are loved. And that we need to accept and believe that God is the giver of all good gifts. You may need to ask God for those gifts in abundance. 
And many of us have. You may need to ask. And as you do, you follow Jesus and you learn to face the world. Today, commit yourselves to accept the gift of life that God freely gives to you as he prays for each of us. Gracious God, thank you for the privilege we have of being loved by you. We can count it as nothing but privilege. Because you loved the world, but you loved each one of us as you formed us and knit us together in our mother's womb. We thank you, God, that we can be here today and that we can hear you calling us. Receive what you are given through your Son and take it to the world that needs us so desperately.